Welcome, everyone. I'm Dorothea Israel Wolfson, the director of the government program at Johns Hopkins University. Thank you for joining us today for this special event to commemorate Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. In 1990, Congress designated the month of May as AAPI Heritage Month to highlight the achievements of Asian and Pacific Islander Americans. Congress chose the month of May to honor two milestones in particular. The first immigrant from Japan who came to the United States in May of 1843, as well as the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad on May 10th, 1869, which was built primarily by Chinese immigrants. We are honored today to have co-authors, Dr. Judy Sijun Wu and Dr. Gwendolyn Mink joining us today to discuss the legacy of Patsy Mink captured in their book, Fierce and Fearless. Patsy Takamoto Mink, first woman of color in Congress. Patsy Mink was not only the first woman of color in Congress where she served for 24 years, but also the lead author and sponsor of Title IX, which was renamed after her death, the Patsy T. Mink Equal Opportunity in Education Act and just celebrated its 50th anniversary last year. Now, Dr. Wu is a professor of history and Asian American studies at the University of California, Irvine. She also serves as faculty director of the Humanities Center and associate dean in the School of Humanities of Research, Faculty Development, and Public Engagement. She is the inaugural director of the Center for Liberation, Anti Racism, and Belonging. Dr. Wendy Mink is a policy scholar who writes about poverty policy, gender issues, and equality in the US. She was professor of politics at the University of California, Santa Cruz for 20 years, and the Charles N. Clark Professor of Women's Studies and Government at Smith College for seven years. And she actually taught in the MA in Government program for several years as well. Um, since 2008, she has been an independent scholar based in Washington, DC, where she leads and engages social justice pr projects. So let's begin exploring the life of Patsy Mink. We'll start with this 20 minute documentary and then open up things for questions for Dr. Wu and Dr. Mink. I encourage you in the audience to submit your questions in the chat box. All right, Peter, let's get started with the film. Okay, great, uh, having everyone back now. What a great documentary. And I, and I think anyone watching this film would just marvel at the amazing achievements of Patsy Takamoto Mink. Uh, who was the first in so many respects, the first Japanese American woman to run for and win a seat in, um, in the Hawaii State House, the first uh, uh, Japanese American woman to practice law in Hawaii, uh, the first woman of color to serve in Congress, uh, and the first uh, Asian American to ever run for the presidency. And of course, she is a co-sponsor of, of Title IX, which was renamed the Patsy Takamoto Mink Equal Opportunity Act uh, in higher education, which has had an enormous impact, of, as we know, upon millions and millions of, 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 of American women. Um, despite being such this, this great icon um, in, in the feminist uh, movement, uh, you point out in your book that there have been few studies or books about her, and it's, it's puzzling. More attention seems to have been paid to uh, feminist leaders such as Gloria Steinem or Betty Friedan from that era, who did not hold political power, but who led movements or, or, or wrote books. Um, and Patsy was one of the few who rose and wielded power which to me is all the more remarkable given all the obstacles that, was, that were in her way. Um, so I guess I'll start by asking, how did her battles and achievements as a legislator differ from the other second wave feminist leaders at the time? Is the relative lack of attention on her compared to other feminist leaders because she worked from within the power structures of the day as a Congresswoman while other feminists operated outside and maybe were more visible in, in a sense? Do you want me to begin or do you yes, want to begin? Sure, Judy, yeah. Why don't you yes. begin, Judy? Okay. I think there's multiple layers and I, that's just a great question. Thank you so much for inviting us and for, and for that question. I think there is more attention given to movement activists um, of that 60s and 70s era. And that's part of what they were bringing to the table. They were advocating that um, the grassroots, um, the people who don't have power needed attention. And they were advocating for that in terms of scholarship as well. Um, and also there was that broader attitude concern about 
um, you know, people over 30, people with power, held the, holding them to suspicion. Um, there's a really great interview that was conducted by an Asian American woman activist with Patsy Mink. And she described Patsy Mink as 200% American, that she really believed in the democratic process, whereas someone who, like the, the interviewer was much more oppositional, thinking about revolutionary ideas. So I think there is that, that polarization. But at the same time, um, other legislators have since been recuperated into the popular narrative. So I think about the Hulu series, Mrs. America. So you do have Shirley Chisholm, um, Bella Absug. So these are also pretty progressive women in political office who've, been, who've resurfaced in terms of our popular memory of that time period. But it's so striking to me that Patsy Meek was not even a side character. So yeah. I think there is something about the ways in which Asian American women in particular are racialized and invisibilized in terms of US history. Um, and the final thing I'll just say is that even though Patsy is in Congress and has access to the ability to, to make laws, she was in conversation with movement activists. Yeah. So legislation like Title IX, she's in conversation. She's trying to think, how do I translate some of these ideas that are coming from the grassroots? And how do I translate that into policy? Right. And that, that's what you call legislating feminism, right? Working with these groups and, 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 and enacting uh, laws to reflect. Uh, Wendy, did you want to address that? No, I think that's a pretty complete answer. I would also say, though, that, um, well, as Judy said, I mean, it's complicated and there are different sort of vectors to that answer. And one of which is that the, the living, breathing force of political change is always the social movement. We don't necessarily uh, look to our institutions for uh, either you know charismatic leaders or sources wellsprings of that kind of change. So that's part of it. Um, but the other part of it is that it takes time for for uh, history and legacies and uh, implications to to percolate in the uh, academic in the scholarly vocation. Let's say so. You know, it's only now that we're getting biographies of of Bella Abzug or Shirley Chisholm that are um, more than reminiscences, right? So I think for all of these folks, it's, um, it's a question of perspective that sort of needs to be attained, you know, and I guess time is the best uh, uh, grantor of perspective before these sorts of um, mammoth uh, life stories get, get told. Yeah, and the time is certainly ripe now, I think, as we all are sort of such beneficiaries of, of Title IX, and it's, it's, it's constantly in the news and, and her legacy. And, you know, Title IX today is uh, celebrated for opening up um, athletic opportunities for women on an equal basis as men. And this was an, indeed a great achievement. And, but we almost lose sight of the fact um, that the initial and primary focus of Title IX was expanding educational opportunities for women. And here too, Title IX has been such a success, you know, given that the, the number of women uh, going to college and graduate schools right now outpaces even that of men. Um, but I, I just wanted to ask a question, was, was Patsy herself an athlete or was she a sports fan? And, and to what extent were athletic opportunities on the, you know, on, the, on her, one of her priorities or, or, or was it mainly education? And then the, just, does she sort of anticipate the impact as well that it would have on women's athletics? Uh, she was not a particular athlete. She did play a little bit of tennis. Okay. Um, she and my father would play tennis on weekends and that sort of thing. When she was in, in high school, uh, women had to play half court basketball. I mean, the, you know, the opportunity to even play, you know, a full game of basketball was, was, uh, limited for women. So, you know, that was not exactly a, an arena that was either open or encouraged for her to develop an interest in. Um, I think it's fair to say that for almost everybody who was involved in germinating Title IX um, as passed in 1972, athletics was not front of mind. Uh, athletics was not even front of mind for the athletic departments <laughs> that woke up, you know, the next morning and, and, you know, slammed their heads into walls thinking, oh my God, what is this going to mean for us? So um, I think that the, it's fair to say that the 
the impulse, the driving force uh, behind the, the creation of this language uh, in education policy was the idea of opening up academic opportunities, vocational opportunities, um, and so forth for women and girls to have uh, parity to thrive and pursue their talents and so forth. Um, but as soon as the athletic issue uh, presented itself, uh, she was immediately um, uh, on board to defend against all incursions to try to uh, limit the application of Title IX to, uh, to constrain athletic opportunity. So it very quickly became um, a major component of Title IX enforcement and policy development by, let's say, early 1973, I'd say. Passage of the law was 1972. So. I'll just add a couple of things. Um, I, we talk about this towards the end of the book, but the year that Patsy Mink died was also the 30th anniversary of Title IX. And um, Maxine Waters gave this very moving eulogy when she recounted that they went to a WNBA game. Um, and just that all these really tall, strong women in many ways owed their opportunities to this very small, petite Asian woman. So I thought that was a really beautiful um, comment. And then also the film that we just saw, Mink, my understanding is that Ben Proudfoot, who won the Academy Award the previous year, he had done a documentary about the first woman to play in the NBA, not the WNBA, but the NBA. And that through his research, he discovered Patsy Mink and became really interested in doing a film about her. Um, and I wish I'd gone to this, but there was a premiere in DC in which Naomi Osaka, who's one of the co-producers, had a chance to attend. Um, so. So exciting, these kind of athletic connections with Patsy Mink's life. Yeah, and it's so interesting and so fitting. Um, in, in, the, in, the, in the book, uh, you talk about um, when she first came to Congress, she and a small group of other Congress members, women, um, could not use the uh, house gym. And that was because the house gym only had a male locker room and that the male members liked to swim in the pool in the nude. And so here she was, she couldn't even get into the house gym. And then she becomes the mother of, you know, Title IX and, and professional sports for women. And, and I, I just thought that was so ironic and so fitting though, right? Yeah, I think that episode is fantastic for political theater because yeah. women could get access, but very limited hours because it was very much assumed to be male space. And then when Patsy and two other legislators went to protest, the staff there said, well, this is for members only. So it just, you know, rubbing salt into the wound and they, they point to the sign for members only, we are members of the house and we deserve access. Um, but they brought with them photographers. I mean, they were anticipating these obstacles and they wanted to make sure that, that the public understood what an unequal um, playing ground um, Washington DC was. Yeah, I mean, there's so many obstacles that you talk about, that obstacle, some of the run-ins she had with other uh, colleagues, male colleagues um, on the Hill, uh, in particular, Edgar Bergman, uh, who was, I guess, the chair of the Democratic Panel Council's Committee uh, for National Priorities. And when she was trying to get him, uh, you can probably talk more about it but than me, but she was trying to get him to prioritize women's issues. And to that, she was told that women have surges of hormones and lunar phases that could really impact their ability to think clearly. And, 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 and then, of course, she ended up opposing as well in another uh, battle, uh, the nomination of, of, of uh, Harold uh, Carswell, who had an interesting history, to say the least, about women's equality. Um, can you talk more about some of the obstacles that she faced as a, a, a feminist legislator and, um, and, and, and how she, um, you know, how she, you know, who supported her, how she was able to really be a pioneer in, in this area? with a handful of other female legislators? You know, I think that's almost an impossible question to answer because when you think of it, there were only 11 women in the House of Representatives. Yeah. Uh, somewhat evenly divided, I think, between Republicans and Democrats. Um, there were not that many of those 11 who identified with the women's movement or who would use the word feminist to describe themselves. So the pool of allies was smaller than the 11 even yeah. um, in, in the House of Representatives. So forging coalitions, you know, bringing people over to your way of thinking, 
uh, your way of seeing the world, I think very much depended on what was happening outside the halls of Congress, very much depended on movements and local communities letting it be known to their male representatives uh, that issues affecting women's equality, women's access to resources, women's credit, women's banking rights, all of those, those things that were inaccessible to women on their own terms in the 60s and, and 70s, that those things matter. And as the movement made itself heard and as local groups of, of women voters made themselves heard, uh, you know, male legislators who were predisposed to democratization, predisposed to uh, progressive ideas, were more willing to join the few women who were leading the way in uh, taking a stand. And so uh, ultimately by, I think it's 1970, Martha Griffiths, who was a very important women's rights uh, representative from Michigan was able to get a discharge petition for the Equal Rights Amendment, which had been sitting in the Judici Judiciary Committee since like 1923 or something, right? So, um, but it, a discharge petition requires signatures. So mm -hmm. that means you have to have uh, large numbers of your colleagues, almost all of whom are male, willing to, to sign on. So I, I do think that absent, absent the movements of the late 1960s, the individual women who paved the way legislatively would not have been able to accomplish what they did accomplish, um, not the least of their accomplishments being Title IX, the most durable certainly uh, being Title IX. Yeah. yeah, I definitely want to underscore what Wendy just said, because even in that episode that we saw in the documentary, um, the legislators, the male legislators recounted that they were sort of swarmed <laughs> by feminist <laughs> Um, you know, lobbyists, activists who were pursuing them into the elevators, into their offices, that they were not going to let it rest. So having that intense political pressure by social movement activists made a huge difference. I was also going to share that I think it wasn't just something that Patsy had to face within Congress, but it's a lived reality being an Asian American woman um, in Washington, D.C. in the mid-60s and 70s. Um, she was asked to perform hula on national television. Um, and certainly she practiced hula. <laughs> that was part of her kind of cultural identity. But it's so striking that uh, an Asian American woman politician would be asked to perform a dance. I can't quite imagine a white male politician being invited to do that. Um, there's newspaper accounts describing her, not necessarily her politics, but how she looked and even um, an inquiry about her measurements. So that type of female objectification was something that, that really she had to experience on a, on a pretty regular basis. Yeah, no, you write about that extensively in the book, and it was so interesting how she was, you know, the DC pundits shortly after she was elected, there was such much, so much focus on her exoticness, and they compared her marriage to your father, John, um, as a happy Madam Butterfly ending, uh, which really served to reinforce those Asian, you know, stereotypes of passivity and, and gender stereotypes as well. And it seemed like she was viewed more as a celebrity at first, even though she was 37, I think years old at the time, and she was in a you know a lawyer, a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School. And I think she quipped, I don't think, in, the photographers were hounding her, right? And, and taking pictures all the time. And I think she said, I don't think my constituents elected me just to get my picture taken, right? And so I guess like, you know, there, this, how did this reception, at all, did, I don't know if she spoke about it or, you know, did, did it sort of motivate her even more? to be such a consequential um, and uh, serious legislator? I don't think it was a motivating factor, uh, except to prove maybe that she was, uh, you know, a serious thinker, a serious legislator and not the window dressing that she was made out to be by photographers who just wanted, you know, the exotic picture of the lady from Hawaii throwing a snowball or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the demure oriental doll and, and that sort of uh, thing. I think that later on, certainly, um, her experience with a very public uh, objectification um, undoubtedly uh, sort of made room in her consciousness and heart for understanding what 
other women go through in term in those you know in similar terms but on a much more uh, local level or daily life kind of level and so she was always very concerned to uh, to compound the the uh, struggle for rights with a struggle for basically the re-education of the population to um, to uh, embrace equality by embracing the humanity of uh, women, of people of color, immigrants, and so forth. And so, you know, as a Title IX was not the end of the line for her, for example, with respect to educational equity. Uh, the following year, she introduced uh, something called the Women's Educational Equity Act, which uh, it intended to fund um, curriculum review and renovation across the educational system uh, to you know get rid of C spot run C Dick go to work C Dick's wife bake cookies kind of you know all of that social gender socialization that uh, kids and and uh, the public were were subjected to um, you know and that was kind of a repeated um, theme throughout her her uh, service. Yeah. yeah, I really think about Title IX and the Women's Educational Equity Act as um, two halves. So Title IX, um, barring discrimination, and then Women's Educational Equity Act, providing resources that we can actually transform educational content. Yeah, and, and you mentioned, um, uh, Wendy, that she really sought to embrace the equality of all groups, all all immigrants, all, all, um, all minorities, all anyone, any citizen who was marginalized. And I think you call this in your book, um, you, you describe her as an intersectional legislative feminist. And she was in many ways a pioneer in this area as well, uh, because the term intersectionality really wasn't introduced until 1989 by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, right? Um, but she had been engaged, I think you say in essence, she was doing this already, you know, since you know, much earlier. And she, you know, I guess, what can we learn from the ways in which she used intersectionality uh, for not only issues pertaining directly to Asian American Pacific Islanders, but for all so many different groups. Now, I think even Kimberly Crenshaw would say that even though she's known for that term, she's really drawing from other women of color feminists, yeah. and they in turn are drawing from, um, you know, people who are, who have lived realities that in which gender is not the only factor shaping their lives, shaping structures of inequality. Um, so thinking about class, race, um, motherhood, and so on and so forth. I mean, you were previously mentioning Mink's opposition to Carswell, and that was based on an intersectional argument, right? There was a, a court case in which a, a mother was denied a professional opportunity. And the courts decided, well, you can either decide that she was discriminated as a woman or you can describe her discrimination as a mother, but you can't do both, <laughs> right? It was, such a, it was such a narrow basis for denying um, the recognition of inequality. And so I think Patsy Mink along with others were just trying to say, well, let's really think about the structures of inequality. And then how do we develop policy, not in some sort of blind universal way that presumes white men as the subjects, but let's, let's look at those who are marginalized in multiple ways and how can we design policy that will allow for access, that will allow for equality, um, that will allow for the allocation of resources to address these, these very serious issues. Yeah. Wendy, did you want to comment on that? No, I think Judy covered it. Yeah, well, you talk about her as a, uh, you mentioned she was a double minority, right? This, her, her status as both an Asian American and as a woman with political power. And again, I guess, how did this heighten, you know, her ability to advocate more, more, more widely? It seemed, did she see herself, it was sort of a double burden as well to be all things to Asian Americans and all things to women, or how did she navigate that? Huh, that's a, a tough one. I, I think, you know, she navigated it as uh, needs arose, you know, as crises and issues uh, arose. Obviously, her own um, uh, double status, double outsider status as an Asian American and as a woman 
was never far from her, you know, daily consciousness. Not that she was preoccupied with herself, but it, her her experience of daily life, let's say, um, was uh, inevitably uh, marked by by that double outsider status. But she was committed to civil rights, to labor rights, to uh, immigrant rights, to um, uh, you know. Uh, poor people's rights. And all of those things were part of her uh, menu of advocacy. And sometimes they overlapped and intersected each of those um, platform issues and sometimes they didn't. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't a problem in her mind that, oh, today I'm, I'm having to focus on uh, poverty rights and uh, that's not enough focus on Asian American issues or something like that. That was never sort of a uh, concern of hers. It was just basically uh, democratizing access to resources and participation in American life was her goal for all groups, some of which she was a member of and some of which she was an ally of, uh, and to all she was equally uh, committed. And do you think she got that enormous empathy from her own experiences of being, you know, she sort of denied entry, you know, to medical school or, or her grandparents uh, and, and, and their experience uh, in, in Hawaii? Um, or, I mean, it's, I guess it's hard to know where that came from, but she certainly had it in abundance. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't pinpoint a specific source. I certainly think that everybody is marked by their experiences and experiences of injury certainly heighten our awareness of larger problems that can inflict injury on, on others. So certainly being uh, you know, denied admission to medical school, certainly being denied the right to live in a dormitory alongside white girls, yeah. um, you know, all of those things uh, made a huge difference. Um, certainly the fact that, you know, that World War II affected the Japanese American community in the way that it, it did through incarceration and surveillance and, and so forth. Um, also Franklin Roosevelt, she listened to his fireside chats religiously, you know, and sort of uh, got a sense of, of um, you know, the government pledging uh, to assist the forgotten American, you know, as a, as a, as a major moral uh, impulse. So, you know, all of those things mixed together, I guess, are um, the, the ingredients of what she became, but um, specifically where, uh, where she looked to in terms of her own experience, I can't say. Yeah. I was just going to share two things. Last year, it was such a wonderful honor to be able to go to the Capitol twice. And Wendy was a featured speaker twice, once during Women's History Month, and Billie Jean King was honored along with Patsy Mink. And also in June for the 50th anniversary of Title IX, there was a portrait of Bailey and Patsy Mink, and Billie Jean King came back as well. Um, and she, Billie Jean King said something I, I thought was so powerful, which is like, you don't understand inclusion unless you've experienced exclusion. And I think that captures what you're saying, Dorothea. Yeah. And it, it was just, it felt so profoundly true. And of course, um, people who perhaps have experienced privilege can develop an awareness of their privilege and can develop awareness and sympathy for those who have not had the same access. But I think having been excluded really helps you become even more attuned to the process, not only of being included yourself, but hopefully opening doors so that others can also be included. Um, the second thing I just wanna share that in addition to, I think being Asian American and female, um, I think being from the Pacific was a big um, influence, life shaping orientation. Um, that Hawaii is a set of islands in the middle of the Pacific that's, that seems so geographically removed from the continent of the United States that I think Patsy was very attuned to other islands um, that have not had become the, um, achieved the status of statehood. So thinking about Guam, American Samoa, um, the trust territories, and the types of violences that occur in those locations, um, militarism, nuclear testing, um, and so there have been discussions of Asian Americans as settler colonialists who furthered the U.S. imperial project in some of those locations. Um, 
I think Pafsi was really attuned to the ways in which various groups, including indigenous groups, have been marginalized on their own lands and um, try to work in allyship to foster democratic voice and um, democratic inclusion. Yeah, I think that's so interesting to focus on the exclusion and how that makes you more sensitive toward, you know, ending that and, and, and enhancing inclusion. And I think in part, you know, Asian Americans as a group, you know, um, do not participate in politics as much as, as, as other groups, actually. And it's gotten better as far as voter turnout and mobilization and things like that. And, and Patsy even said um, in the film that she would not have I think gotten into politics, maybe she was joking a bit, if she had just gotten a job, right, in a law firm upon graduating from law school. Um, but what did she think of the fact that, I mean, she was exceptional in this regard, that she did become super active, obviously, and really advocated so strongly for the community and others. Uh, but what did, did she ever talk about the fact that Asian Americans do tend to participate a little uh, at lower rates in politics than other Americans? Was she worried about that at all? And I, again, I think it just throws into relief how much she stood out to you know, go forward in a field that you know, a woman and an Asian American, those are two things I think that are you know, huge obstacles. Well, I think she was concerned about uh, encouraging participation and showing that there are stakes to participation for mm -hmm. um, all groups. And she certainly did whatever she could to uh, participate in voter mobilization among Asian Americans and, and the like. Um, with respect to, it's sort of a, a double, uh, double angle of vision though for somebody from Hawaii uh, because the Asian American population in Hawaii um, was much more politically active, had high, much higher participation rates in terms of, of voting and mobilization primarily through the Democratic Party than Asian Americans on the continental United States. So, um, you know, it was less of, a, less of an issue thinking about her district, say, to think in, in ethnic terms, in terms of voter mobilization, it was more important to think of everybody getting out to vote, it was more important to think about making sure young people feel they have a stake in whatever the, the outcome of the election is uh, and that sort of thing, which is different, uh, a different um, uh, line of participatory concern than the Asian American one. Yeah. I was just gonna share three things. Hopefully I can keep all three of them in my mind. <laughs> but I, one of the things that really struck me about Patsy's electoral base was that it was not um, the financial and political center of Hawaii. So it was not Honolulu. It was really the outskirts, right? The kind of rural areas, the plantation towns, the outside villages, uh, not villages, outside islands. Um, and that was actually a strategy because when she was first elected to the House of Representatives, instead of going to a rally where uh, Wendy and, and her father went to in Honolulu, Patsy chartered plane and went to the, the other islands. And that what made a huge difference. And so I think about these people who are not only on the edge of the United States, but on the edge of Hawaii, who are electing Patsy to office repeatedly, even after she passed away, they elected her to Congress as a sign of respect for her. Wow. Um, the second thing I wanted to share is that Patsy would always talk about women having the power to actually make political change because we're actually a demographic majority, right? right? And so if there was actually more political coherence among um, this particular group, there could actually be the demographic basis for enacting policies, changing politics. Um, and so obviously there's other factors that are in place, right? There's structural force, there's socialization forces, um, but I thought that insight was very powerful. And then finally, just in terms of Asian American political mobilization today, um, you know, there's various scholars who have tried to look at uh, non-traditional forms of political participation. So maybe thinking about digital media culture, um, not necessarily just through electoral politics, um, especially given that there's a heavily immigrant, um, perhaps people who are not yet citizens, right? So there's maybe different ways to measure political participation. And then um, just recently, I went to a committee of 100 conference in San Jose. And the committee of 100 is an organization of Chinese American you know, cultural, economic, political leaders. And what really struck me about that setting is that this group could very easily 
um, espouse the politics of being model minorities. But instead, they were really taking on the politics of addressing anti-Asian hate. They're concerned about the targeting of scientists presumed to be spies. Um, they recently conducted a study with a social scientist in Colombia about the needs, the lies of Chinese Americans, and there's interest in thinking about class and gender. So I think it's interesting that perhaps what might seem like a fairly mainstream organization is becoming more and more progressive in terms of its, its politics, or at least from my, my perspective. Um, so I think we might look for different forms of Asian American political participation beyond the electoral politic, political realm. Yeah, that, that's fascinating, right, that you can't measure it just by that alone, right? And they're promising signs all over the place. So um, I wanted to ask two questions actually from the audience I wanted to get at uh, before we wrap up. And uh, one is from Paula Nira, and she asks, can you comment on the cynical defense of Title IX that is being used by anti-LGBTQ plus legislators and organizations to justify barring transgender girls and young women from competing in athletics aligned with their gender identity. Thank you. Yeah, it's been in the news a lot. This Title IX is, is constantly being revisited, I know. Well, the, the questioner um, said it best when she termed it a cynical move. I mean, it, the Republicans uh, primarily who are, are leading this charge are trying to twist Title IX into its opposite. Right, Title IX is a vehicle of inclusion. It's, you know, it's broad language that gets plugged into different kinds of applications um, in order to promote the inclusion of women or men in, in situations in which they have been excluded um, in the educational context. And uh, over the 50 years of its um, application in law, the understanding of what it means to promote gender and sex inclusion has been expanded to include LGBTQ and trans issues. Um, in all cases, it's it's an opening. It's you know it's ever opening the uh, doors of participation, and any effort to try to say that Title IX would support closing the doors to the participation of trans people or LGBTQ people. Um, is in fact a, a cynical move. I can't quote her exactly, but Senator Hirono last week or the week before that had a, uh, an excellent statement in Judiciary Committee and where, where she was taking on um, advocates of, of uh, using Title IX in order to res restrict the uh, equities available to uh, trans athletes in particular. Um, in which she in which she said exactly this. It's it's a it's a it's a twisting um, insult to the people who enacted Title IX and to Title IX itself to uh, try to use it as the platform for accomplishing uh, inequality. I see. Would you agree with that, Judy? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. We have one, one more question. I know we're, we're we're out of time, but I want to ask the last question here, which is from Sam. Robefogel, uh, how did Representative Ming view representation and statehood for U.S. territories? Take it away, Judy. <laughs> okay. I was, so she was on a committee that surveyed the living conditions, the working conditions in the Pacific Islands. Um, that, you know, the territories of the United States are part of the United States. And the fact that they are territories um, remind us <laughs> of the imperial tradition of this nation and the unequal political status that places like Puerto Rico um, and other places in the Pacific hold, including Washington, D.C., actually, <laughs> right? So she was someone who asked, you know, is this an American place? And if it is, then why is there such stark socioeconomic inequality, right? So she was always advocating for the, that the same resources that were given to states were also given to territories. And she was in conversation with representatives from the territory so that she can help advocate, help support. Um, but I think she had longstanding concerns about the, the political inequalities that continue to exist in the United States, whether it's along the lines of gender, class, race, or along these lines of kind of political, a political status. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, she was consistent on everything there and did so many great, uh, great things in Congress, obviously, and uh, had a, her legacy is still with us. And um, we are out of time, though, so I will close it by thanking both of you for joining us today for such an interesting and engaging conversation about Patsy Mink. And, and congratulations on this wonderful book you've written. I understand it also received a prize, the Organization of American History Award for the best book in women and gender history. So congratulations for all the great Great work you've done and for, for bringing her. I think it, the time is right for us to really come back and, and revisit her legacy and, and, and appreciate it even more given all the how much we've all benefited from it. So thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Oh, yes, sure. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Yes. Wonderful you. questions. Thank you.